All right. Hey, we are ready to go. Welcome to Cascadia Church. Good to have all of you here with us. I know that some in our church family are not feeling too well, but you're able to watch, and we hope that you are, and others who watch as well. Thank you for, for tuning in. We welcome you. We've prayed. Uh, we've checked in. We're back in Route 66, back on the road again, so to speak. We took a little break during the holiday season to look at some uh, biblical teaching surrounding the birth of Christ and the new year and planning and so forth. But now we're back into Route 66. We're in the book of Galatians. And uh, we're going to survey that book and find out what God has for us. Let me begin by this way. Uh, not a lot of people realize or know that Jesus Christ was Jewish. He, uh, he wasn't a Christian. He was Jewish. And uh, born into a Jewish family, his first followers were all Jews. They were all Jewish the early church in its infancy was made up only of Jewish people. But Jesus told his Jewish followers, his disciples, take the message of the gospel into the whole world and make disciples. And as they did that, more and more non-Jewish people were added to the church. And then by the time we get to the end of the book of Acts in the New Testament, the church is predominantly a Gentile or a non-Jewish phenomenon. So something that started out Jewish ended up with Jews and Gentiles or non-Jewish people together in the same body, the same spiritual body of Christ. And so it raises a question that people still struggle with today. And the question is this, because the church had Jewish beginnings, should Christians continue with Jewish behaviors? Because the church had Jewish beginnings, should Christians continue with Jewish behaviors? And the answer is a resounding no. No, we are not to. Judaism is rich in its traditions, its customs, its teachings, but those are not for non-Jewish Christians, or even for Jewish Christians. It's not for us to observe or to follow the law in the way that God instructed Israel to do so, or even the man-made rules, regulations, in order to try to keep the law. Now, <clears throat> I have Christian friends who would strongly disagree with me, and that's okay. We can disagree. Uh, I read recently on Facebook, a friend of mine wrote, and lamented, actually, how he had missed his daughter's soccer game. Uh, it was a Saturday, and he didn't really know how to use the GPS function on his phone, and he was trying to find this location where his daughter was playing soccer, and the more he was driving around, the more he realized, I don't have enough gas to get to wherever I need to be and then to get home. And because it's a Sabbath, I'm not allowed to pump gas. So he went home and missed his girl's his daughter's soccer game. Now, I just think that's ridiculous. If, if Those who are observant understand that you're not allowed to drive a car on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to travel by any means, even on foot, more than three quarters of a mile from your home. And so if you're going to follow the law, if you're going to follow Sabbath, follow it completely. Don't just pick and choose little bits and pieces. My, my friend is imprisoned in a world of religious legalism, thinking that if he follows these rules, he will demonstrate to himself and to God and perhaps others that he is righteous or pious. That's not what the law is about. That's not what the Sabbath is about. That's not what Christianity is about. We read this in the scriptures, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, here's the application, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Slavery to what? The law. The strict guidelines and rules by which one must live in order to be made or to demonstrate a right relationship with God. 
However, that's, a, that's an incomplete understanding of the purpose of the law. I'll reveal the purpose of the law in just a few moments. But Galatians, and I, did, I want to move forward with this. Galatians was written for friends like mine and others that I know who, who believe and live the same way uh, that uh, who, who, those who do not understand that freedom in Christ means not that we're, to do, we're free to do whatever we want, but it means we've been freed from a yoke of slavery. We're not bound by man-made applications or man-made rules that try to keep us within this framework of what is righteous and what is unrighteous. And so the book of Galatians, as we look at it this morning, is going to help us to understand what it means to have spiritual liberty, freedom in Christ. Once again, I want to underscore this strongly. Freedom in Christ, spiritual liberty, doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we want. That's lawlessness, and that's a sin. We are free to no longer have to be bound by the law and man-made rules and regulations. Let's do a, a quick introduction in the survey of the book of Galatians. Uh, in 10 words or less, here's just a short little synopsis of what the book is about. Christians are free from restrictive man-made laws. You can add to that if you want to make it more than 10 words. Also, having to obey the Old Testament law in order to be made right with God. Because that can't happen, and you'll see why in just a few moments. So God never intended us to be made right with him by keeping the law. The theme of Galatians is freedom. And the key verse is the one that I read just a moment ago, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, a little talk with a friend this morning about what this cartoon is all about. And uh, he got the gull cor portion correct, okay? So what is this gull doing? Laying an egg. <clears throat> but what, what about this egg? It's real shiny. Gull lay shine. Yes, gull lay shine. I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. The freedom, freedom, you've been released, you're no longer bound, okay? Or you can go gallet chains if you want to, something to that effect. All right, I'm just a messenger. All right, let's take a look, let's get into this, let's move forward. <clears throat> Item number one, the gospel of grace draws me to Jesus. So important. The apostle wrote in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I'm amazed, I'm stunned, I'm shocked. I can't believe it. That you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So, uh, this is, doesn't take a rocket surgeon to understand this, but a different gospel is something other than the true gospel, right? The true gospel is this. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save sinners. To set us free from the, from the power and the penalty of sin. And someday, ultimately, we will be delivered from the presence of sin, but that's coming. That's coming. So a different gospel says this. Do whatever you can to please God. Do whatever you can to be made right with God. See, religion is this. Religion is any kind of religion. Think about it. Is please. Is <laughs> trying to reach up to God. But Christianity is God reaching down to mankind because we can't reach that high. But God reached down and out far enough through son, his son Jesus when Jesus came to be one of us, to live with us, to die in our place, to rise from the dead, to ascend into heaven and prepare a place for us. That's the gospel. So these Galatians, they lived in the southern portion of what is modern-day Turkey, and uh, there were Jews in that region who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they were born again. They knew Jesus as their Savior. And by the grace of God, they were brought into his family, but they had begun reverting back to their old habits, their old lifestyle of following the law. 
living by works. And uh, later in Galatians, the apostle writes this, you who are seeking to be justified or declared righteous by the law, notice this, you have fallen from grace. That's a strong statement. That's a strong statement. This idea of to be justified by the law means that I have to perform at a certain level in order to be accepted by God or approved by God or enter into a relationship with God. Now, this is not just a problem among the Galatian Jews. It happens to non-Jewish Christians even today. And I'm not thinking about anybody in particular, but let me just give you a couple of examples to just kind of a self-examination here. Just think about this for a few moments. Don't, re- don't raise your hands. I just want you to think about this. How many of you believe that if you don't read your Bible, God's not going to love you? How many of you believe that if you don't go to church, God's going to reject you? How many of you sometimes think that if I don't financially support my home church or another kind of ministry, God is not going to bless me. He's going to withhold his blessings. There are people who teach that. It's not true. It's not true. These are all good things. It's good to read your Bible, and you should. It's good to be going to church, and you should. It's good to be financially supporting your home church, and you should. Those are all biblical commands. And we do that when we can. Well, we don't do that to be made right with God. We do that to show that we are right with God, to demonstrate that we love him, we want to be pleasing to him, we want to be obedient to him. And yes, there are benefits for doing these things. There, God, God loves it when we read his word. Uh, God, God strengthens our relationship with him and with one another when we go to church. And God blesses us in return in many ways, financially and in other ways, when we financially support ministries. That's all true. But when you do these things, don't do them to impress God. He's not impressed. Don't do these things to impress others. <laughs> they're not impressed. Because if, if, if this is the mindset, they're really more focused on what they are doing instead of what you are doing. Think about it. Galatians 2.16, God accepts only those who have faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get accepted by God. That's how you please him. No one can please God by simply obeying the law. I have friends, excuse me, who are Christians who maybe have not yet read this verse. So we put our faith in Christ Jesus and God accepted us because of our faith. It's by faith. God is pleased when we say yes to the way that he demonstrated his love to the cross. That pleases God. And as we see by the main point here this morning, that it is the grace of God that draws us to Jesus. And that's the only place in Christ where spiritual freedom can be found. So when you you begin to understand just how much God loves you, just how much he wants you into his family. We are drawn to that, and we learn to say yes to what he's done for us through his son, Jesus. Which brings us to this next point, number two. The gospel of grace puts me in the family of God. The gospel of grace puts me in the family of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, up to the end of chapter 4. But here's what 3.26 says. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Not by the works of the law, not by the good things or the good deeds that you can do. That's not how you become God's child. You become God's child, you're put into God's family through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, see the verse here? There are some who go far beyond the boundaries of this verse, and they will say things like, we're all God's children. No, we are not. It's not true. We're all made in the image of God. Yes. God gave life to each one of us. Yes. But 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 uh, says, some of you are children of the devil. And some of you have met them. <laughs> some of you know some of them. You're either in or you're out. That's what 1 John is all about. And not everybody's in. 
Only those who have put faith in Christ Jesus can be truly called the children of God. It's not those who try to fulfill the works of the law and all the man-made rules and regulations that come along with how do you do this and how do you do that. It's through faith. So then how, how exactly do we become children of God? Sons and daughters of God. The Apostle Paul answers the question by using a, a cultural practice for the Galatians and others in the Roman culture, in the Roman world. Uh, and he talks about children of their father, specifically the oldest one, the heir to the family possessions, whatever they might be, to the father's household and all of his possessions. And he explains that a child, even though he's in line to be the heir, and technically, legally, what belongs to his father is going to belong to him at some point, that child is not an heir until he reaches a certain age and a declaration of made, is made that you're my child. You're the heir to the inheritance that has been stored up and is waiting for you. And even though someday that child will, will actually inherit what has been held or, or promised, uh, that child has no rights to the family possessions, no guarantee that he or she will receive those possessions until that child becomes an adult and is declared to be the heir. And until that time comes, that child uh, is no different than a slave or an employee who has no rights, no rights. Here's how the Apostle Paul writes this. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave. Although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So all that kind of comes into place for you now. You understand what the apostle is saying, what he's writing. He's making a point by analogy. He's using a cultural dynamic or a cultural equivalent, actually. Talking about something physical, and he relates it to the spiritual. And so... Biologically and legally, a turning point for a child to become the heir happens when that child reaches a certain age and a declaration is made. Spiritually, for you and me, the turning point comes in our life when we actually become, when we are declared to be a child of God and an heir of all things spiritual, the recipient of those blessings, the inheritance waiting for us after we arrive at a certain point in our spiritual journey. And that point, that place is the cross where we encounter Christ and are made righteous through faith in Jesus. So earlier in Galatians, the Apostle Paul made this point. The law has become our guardian. Remember we read in the previous verse about children under different guardians? The law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ. That's the purpose of the law to lead us to Christ. So that, here's why, we may be justified or declared right with God by faith, not by works, not by keeping the rules, but by trusting in Jesus only. But now that faith has come, notice this, we are no longer under your guardian. What does that mean? You have been declared the heir. You have been declared a child, a daughter, or a son of God. And you're in the family. You're in the family. So you look at these verses here, and you see that the purpose of the law is to reveal our sin. If you try to keep all 613 commandments in the Old Testament, you can't do that. It's just not possible for any human. Jesus was the only one who was able to do that. So the purpose of the law reveals sin. The Apostle Paul said, I wouldn't have known that coveting was a sin if I didn't read in the Bible that it says that coveting is a sin. And so we are convicted by the law that we have fallen short and we need help. 
And so he says here, the purpose of the law is to lead us to Christ, who is the only sinless one who was ever able to fulfill the law perfectly. And he fulfilled the law in our place. So when we say yes to what Jesus did for us at the cross, we receive the gift of God's grace in Christ. And then God adopts us into his family. Here's how John put it, John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Receiving Christ means we say yes to what he did for us at the cross. I've I've fallen short. I've missed the mark. I've sinned. I need help. My only help is in Christ. And so I'm appealing to him as my Savior, the one who can forgive me and give me new life. And that is what puts us into God's family. Which leads right into our final point. Number three is this. The gospel of grace gives me the Holy Spirit. Gives me the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're paying attention, you've seen that I've mentioned the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're all woven into the gospel of grace. They are all actively involved in what it means for you to be in God's family and to be free. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons or children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. I read this verse and I I reflect back on my first trip to Israel. Uh, We went to Gideon Spring, a place called En Harod, near Mount Gilboa, where Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle. And we saw Gideon Spring there, and there's a large park and a playground, and it was a national holiday. I don't know what the holiday was, uh, but it was crowded. <clears throat> and I was with my, my cousin, Mikey, uh, sitting near the pool, and uh, there's a little child that went down the slide and tumbled over and scraped up his knees and started crying, and he's looking for his daddy, and he's going, Abba, 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 Abba. It's the Hebrew word for daddy. And he's crying out for his daddy. And it really touched me. Just like, whoa, I get that. That's kind of neat. And so here's what what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit within us affirms that God is our father. He affirms that God is our father. And that he loves us. And that we can run to him and we can cry out to him for compassion and care whenever we're hurting. Why? Because we're family. He's there for us. And the Spirit of God does so much more. He does so much more. He gives us hope for the future. He gives us the assurance that things will be better, maybe in this life, but for sure in the life to come. No doubt about that. See chapter 5, verse 5. We, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now, the hope of righteousness is when we have left this earth and we're in God's presence forever. Now, he's with us spiritually now, but when we're done here and we go into his presence eternally, that's the hope of righteousness, being with him eternally. The Spirit of God also makes us aware of the freedom that we have in Christ. And he shows us how to live a life of not lawlessness, but liberty, a life of liberty. See chapter 5, 16 through 18, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. These are powerful words. Very central to the, the, the core of what Galatians, this letter to these churches in Galatia, is all about. Now those who choose to follow the law, even after knowing Christ, uh, they are seeking to fulfill the desires of the flesh. And that is against what the Spirit of God wants for us. 
What does that mean? What does it mean to desire the flesh? What is the most... You don't have to answer this. It's more of a rhetorical question because I'll answer it for you in just a moment. But think about this. What is the most powerful manifestation of the flesh? What, what is the most powerful demonstration of, of what, that, that, that you in the, in the flesh, apart from being controlled by the Spirit of God, want to demonstrate? It's pride. Of all the sins listed in the Scriptures, whenever there's a list of sins, the one that's always at the top of the list, God says he hates the most, is pride. Because pride means I don't need God. I've got me. Who could ask for anything else? Anything more? You know, I've got me. Pride. Pride, I believe, is why people want to demonstrate to themselves and to others and to God just how carefully I'm obeying these rules. Did you see what I did? Did you notice that? I'm following the law. I'm keeping the Sabbath. I posted it on Facebook. Did you see that I'm pious? See that I'm righteous? It's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. Pride is why we try to demonstrate to others through the observance of man-made rules that we are indeed right with God. That's not what it's about. See this here also? The spirit is against the flesh. The Holy Spirit inside of you is going to convince you and convict you that, you know what, this is not right. This is not the way that I want you to live. There's a better way. And that way is found through freedom. So the Spirit of God wants you to think differently. He wants you to behave differently. And that's demonstrated in the fruit of the Spirit. This is what your life looks like when you're living by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is what spiritual freedom looks like. This is what people need to see. Not your rules and regulations that you're following. They need to see the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit of God has an, an active multifaceted ministry in your life and it takes a lifetime to learn to live by the spirit which means that we allow him to lead us and guide us we allow him to be the decision maker in our lives which means we lay down our pride and we live by the spirit <clears throat> notice this verse if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. Now, is the Apostle Paul, we're just about done here, is the Apostle Paul implying that there are some Christians who are not following the Spirit? Yes, that's the whole point of this book. The Apostle Paul knew born-again Christians who had been saved and converted and put into the family of God by the Spirit, but now they're trying to live by following the law. And he's saying, stop it. Some were trying to follow these Jewish rules and regulations and all their celebrations, which are beautiful and wonderful, but that is not what makes you right with God. You can do those things. That's, I'm not condemning anybody who does that. But don't try to tell me that that's what makes you righteous, because that's not true. It's the grace of God that makes you righteous. It's the work of Jesus Christ that makes you righteous. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Period. Strong statement. We're not obligated to follow the rules according to what the Old Testament says is the way to live as a Jew. We're not Jewish. We're Christians. We're non-Jews. Why are we not to do that? Because it's impossible to please God by following the law. It doesn't happen. Only Jesus did that. Now, as we've seen recently, as we went through the first 39 books of the Old Testament in Route 66, there's a lot we can learn from the Old Testament. There's a lot we can learn from the law. In fact, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says that the law is good it's holy. It's righteous. But it's not for those who know Jesus. 
Because we found grace. We found mercy. We found freedom. Here's the point. The point of the law is to point to Jesus. And if we found him, we're free. If we found him, we're free, which is our takeaway. Jesus set me free. He did. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. You don't have to follow somebody else's rules. You need to follow the ones that are in the New Testament, and there are plenty. We're not lawless. We're not free to do whatever we want. But the point, I think, especially with Galatians, is you don't have to try to impress God. It doesn't work. You don't have to try to impress anybody else. They don't care. They're not paying attention. If you know Jesus, it's because God drew you by his grace. Then he accepted you into his family. Then he gave you his spirit. That's Galatians. Live that way. Live in freedom. And then finally, what God has already done for you is all you need. What God has already done for you is all you need. Receive it. Rest in his grace. That's where you belong. Let's pray. Father, there is so much more about grace that we don't understand. We know that it's by grace that we're saved through faith. And even faith is a gift you give to us, and that's an act of your grace. We know that to please you means that we walk in the Spirit with the Spirit, letting him guide us and lead us and be the decision maker in our lives. That takes a a lifetime to learn. But we're on that journey. There are times when we will be successful. There's times when we will fail. Those are learning experiences both ways. So much more to learn. So as we continue to press on, as we continue to learn to live in the Spirit, Father, we need to keep before us in our minds uh, that we've been set free. Uh, We have spiritual freedom. And we are no longer chained to man-made rules, regulations, expectations, We do not have to try to fulfill the Old Testament law in order to be righteous with you. That's not the point of the law. We saw the law as intended to point us to Jesus. That's the point. And once we found him, we live in grace by the power of your spirit. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us demonstrated in this way. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye to our friends who are watching.